Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Robert Gonzalez. I'm the Assistant Dean of Operations and Administration for the Schaefer School of Engineering and Science. And it is my honor to welcome you to today's SES Dean's Lecture Series, featuring Manuela Velosa, Veloso, PhD, Head of AI Research for J.P. Morgan Chase and Company. Today's lecture is scheduled in partnership with the Stevens Institute of Artificial Intelligence, who had their relaunch event earlier today. The lecture will last approximately 45 minutes, followed by a 15-minute question and answer period. During the Q&A, there will be staff members in the aisles of the auditorium. If you, ask, if you get to ask a question, please wait until you're handed the microphone to answer your question. Please join us after the lecture for, for a reception located in Gateway North, room 103. And now, to introduce our speaker, it is my honor to welcome to the podium, Jean Zhu, Laura E. Filer, Dean of the Schaefer School of Engineering and Science. Jean. Thank you, Robert. It's our great honor to have our great speaker, Dr. Manuela Veloso, who is a world-renowned researcher in AI and robotics. Dr. Veloso received her Bachelor of Science and the Master of Science in the Department of Electrical and Computer Science from Technical University of Lisbon, Portugal. Then she came to the US and received her Master of Arts in Computer Science from Boston University. Followed uh, this master degree, she went to CMU, Carnegie Mellon University, where she received her PhD. Uh, then she became a faculty member uh, from CMU, where she worked for 25 years in the Department of Computer Science uh, and uh, Machine Learning Department as the department chair. Uh, as Robert mentioned, she currently is the head of J.P. Morgan Chase AI Research. Her recent interests are in artificial intelligence, symbiot uh, symbiotic human robot, uh, robot autonomy, continuous learning systems, and AI in finance. She is past president of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence and the co-founder and a past president of the Robot Cup Federation. In her career, she received many, many awards, including National Science Foundation Career Award, Alan Noel Medal for Excellence in Research, Radcliffe Fellow, Einstein Chair of Professor of the Chinese, uh, uh, Einstein Chair Professor of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and ACM SIGAR Autonomous Agents Research Award. Dr. Veloso is a fellow of Triple AI, Triple AS, ACM, and IEEE. She was elected in 2022 to the National Academy of Sci uh, Engineering for her contributions to artificial intelligence and its applications in robotics and the finance service industry. Let's welcome Dr. Veloso. Thank you, Jean. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much for the generous introduction. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time telling you a little about AI. I'm sure that we all hear about AI these days, so this is going to be one more talk in AI, so let's see. So I'm going to try to explain to you one thing first, which is the fact that, in fa that AI, one way or another, it's a young science. So this is not chemistry, this is not biology, this is not math. It's just something that started back with uh, Alan Turing in the 30s, and then in the 50s, there was this famous Dartmouth conference in 56, and the reason why I think that this is important for us to look at is because this was a proposal written to the, Amer to the, to the US government asking for money to fund a 10-man 
two months study, and they thought that they could identify under the conjecture that every aspect, every aspect of learning and any other feature of intelligence could be so precisely described that a computer could simulate it. So they thought that 10 people, two months, would solve the AI problem. So, and uh, not, they barely had computers in those days, and uh, we are still struggling to solve this problem. But it's interesting that this proposal was how it was stated that every aspect of learning, every feature of intelligence could be so well described that a machine could do it. And interestingly, these were like the 10 men that uh, were in these uh, kind of like uh, uh, kind of like a think tank or some kind of like a school study, some event, some conference. And the four first ones were the ones that wrote the actual proposal. Uh, McCarthy, Minsky, and then uh, Claude Shannon and Annette Rochester, and then the other six were invited. And out of those six, Herb Simon and Ellen Newell were at Carnegie Mellon, and I knew them very well. And uh, it was always a pleasure to see these co-founders of the field of AI talk about uh, the history of AI. But so, as you see, yeah, I'm maybe not as uh, young as many of you, but it's not that uh, this is the beginning of AI. So it's not Aristotle's, you know? It's really like very close to us. So that's normal. And I think that we should embrace the fact that we don't know all the answers for this AI question. And even if people talk about all these LLMs and Gen AI and all of these things, we are in the discovery mode. We are in the development mode of the science and this engineering of AI. So. That's something that I want to say up front. Everything I'll show you are examples of things that work, that we are understanding more, but it's not that we know it all and uh, we can uh, do great statements yet. We are in a discovering mode. So I'm just going to share with you this picture. This is my homework number one. If you have never met uh, or you, don't, you have not heard of Herb Simon and Ellen Newell, you may want to Google tonight because these two people were um, you know, amazing uh, figures of the field of AI, and they were at Carnegie Mellon, and I am actually happened to be Herb Simon uh, chair, and I knew both of them really well. So what happens with this concept of every aspect of intelligence and every single kind of like feature of uh, learning led me to have uh, in my life as a faculty and as a researcher, uh, a, a lot of interest on putting together everything as autonomous robots. So I developed a lot of, uh, how do you say, algorithms for planning, reasoning, uh, and all sorts of like uh, uh, merging of capabilities to solve specific tasks. I'm not going to tell you about robotics. I'm sorry, Brendan, this is not going to be only on robotics. I'll, I think I show a video later on, but there is not about robotics. And I'm going to focus uh, basically also on the fact that in 2018, I made this change or this move from academia in, a, I was the head of the machine learning department, uh, from academia to JP Morgan Chase. And literally it was not only a move from Pittsburgh to uh, New York, but also kind of a move in terms of like uh, topics of research. So I'm going to uh, just go over a few examples. And the reason why I think this is important is that somehow, though this finance domain is so different than uh, uh, other domains I was used to think about, from an AI point of view, there are many commonalities. So if you, let's delve into this. So the first thing I also want to say is that within that kind of multiple features of intelligence and all sorts of like uh, uh, being very kind of like uh, uh, ambitious in terms of what a computer can do. I always talked about uh, these three kind of pillars of intelligence, perception, cognition, and action. Perception is this feature we have as humans of being able to capture input from our sensors and from the data, from what we read, from the, all the, the stimulus that we get, all the signals, all the stimulus, all the data, and that's also something that led the field to focus a lot on language, on speech, on vision, on all sorts of like data science. So there was this thing about entering. 
And a lot of the, the research is still in this area of the perception part. Okay, so because, you know, and processing data, because whether we like it or not, or whether we acknowledge it or not, uh, there are many things that uh, there is, well, Waze generates a route for us, so things, but uh, the machines are bas basically, the AI is a lot of processing uh, data information, but then there is this capability that humans have on intelligence, the ability to reason, to plan, to learn from experience, to be able to optimize, to be able to actually negotiate with others. So there is all this cognition part, which is still a mystery, but it's part of intelligence. And then we actually move, we actually gesture, we actually dialogue, and so we execute the actions that eventually the cognitive uh, part uh, comes up with. So. I always like to show this slide the same way that I want to make the point that AI is a young science. It's also in interesting to understand that AI is a science and engineering of components, of components. So, and one day we will have eventually the real robot moving around, knowing everything, talking with people, knowing all the topics and being like an actual human. We don't have it yet. We have slices and pieces of things and we'll talk about Gen AI later, but it's still the case that we don't have, especially also from a, an action point of view, uh, robots moving around. At least I didn't see any robot when I came into the building. But, uh, you know, uh, though, though there are, you know, restaurants we go to and have robots that serve now and all sorts of other platforms, but they are not really very intelligent. Who knows how they are? But anyway, so this is it. So young science, the science of components, and uh, this move also let me tell you like this issue about, uh, this is uh, my last slide for the introduction and then I'll go on, but it's mo something about uh, telling you that AI research in the finance domain is something underlying applied AI in which uh, maybe you want to do like specific analysis of specific types of data and AI research is more transformative. And so we serve the whole firm and uh, then there is the data, and then there are these pillars like investment bank, retail banking, uh, wealth management, and commercial bank. So you have the pillars of J.P. Morgan Chase, and now here is the AI research there. So that gives you an understanding of how do I sit uh, in, uh, in uh, this J.P. Morgan Chase. Okay, uh, now we are all settled, hopefully we know. So I'm going to give a few examples. And the first one I'm going to give you as an example is the fact that indeed uh, machine learning can be very powerful. And let's see w one of the examples. So uh, when I came to JP Morgan, uh, they showed me around in this uh, building and one of the floors I went through and I spent a lot of time visiting was this trader's floor. And in the trader's floor, like we see in movies, these people stand behind millions of screens, like this is what I kept seeing, and they keep like making decisions, buy, no buy, and all this. But what was impressive to me as they explained all the markets and that I, I mean, I've learned a lot there, was that these people were surrounded by images. They, nobody had like a, some math tool next to them. They were just looking at screens with plots of how the assets were going. So I kind of like uh, being from a, the robotics world where everything we do is image based. I kind of like thought, oh my gosh, this is like a bunch of images that are guiding these decisions. And so I looked at these images and as we knew that with neural nets, deep neural nets, we could actually uh, be able to classify tons of objects. So we have been on the object detection and classification business in robotics for a long time, being able to detect motorcycles and peoples and tables and chairs and cats and dogs and apples and oranges. We had been like in this uh, classification of, of objects. I wondered if we could use the same techno technology to classify images of signals, images of actually of actual uh, how do you say plots? Or so we 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 show these images, and so we I tried to do this. So what we did was a system that we called Mondrian, which uh, basically uh, pixelates 
a, 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 a signal, transforms it into an image of some dimension. Uh, we scan through the whole, uh, through the whole uh, signal going with right windows, and we train a machine learning uh, neural net uh, with these images trained as, well, when they looked at this, they said, buy, no buy, buy, no buy. And somehow it was not an apple and an orange, but it was just the actual plot of the signal. And with that, it was a, a matrix of pixels. And with that input, we were able to actually predict, I mean, this neural net was able to predict by no buy with high accuracy. So this was the first thing that was somehow, uh, one of the first things that was somehow disruptive because one way or another, it's using images. Now you can ask me, so Manuel, do now at JP Morgan traders use Mondrian to make decisions? No, it's not deployed. It's a research proof of concept, and I'm very, uh, I, I am very careful about selling you this because we are still working with a lot of like the actual traders because somehow, um, you know, I believe it, people believe it, but uh, it's hard for people to just have a machine look at an image and say buy, no buy, without really uh, having developed the technology for such kind of decision. So it's some, and I'll explain in a second how it's used, but it's just an example, and we have been using this example of images for a lot of other uh, problems, but this is an example of something that's an AI research contribution, and eventually, uh, who knows how far it will go in terms of use. But after this, you know, we did something that's also very interesting, which was prediction. So we did Mondrian P for prediction, in which basically, again, we use images, but we basically block the last 20 steps of the image, 20% of the image, and you train on saying if the image looks like this 80%, then this is a completion. And we use in-painting techniques to basically complete uh, stock market plots, signals, with completion like the techniques in robotics or in machine vision that can complete images. If I block you know, part of my eye, it can complete it. So we block the end of the image and we can complete it. And in these kind of like uh, plots, it shows in red what the neural net, the trained neural net, uh, proposes as the completion for the image of the first 80 steps and literally what it was actually. And uh, as you see, the prediction is not that uh, bad and we have a whole paper analyzing the values of how to compare these two signals and uh, it's at the end, I will give you the pointer to all the publications. And, but it's interesting that it's completely uh, machine vision techniques that are basically completion of an image that enable you to make these predictions. And, uh, and so that's the first thing I wanted to tell you, is these, uh, you know, image-based kind of classification and prediction for time series data. Uh, we have done tons of more work as we speak on time series data that I'm not going to uh, focus on now, but I'm going to uh, switch to another example. So first example, this image-based kind of like uh, uh, classification and prediction. So uh, the next example I'll give you, it's something that is actually uh, really important also for us to uh, embrace which is the problem of discovering information publicly available. So the, we'll talk about generative AI at the end, but uh, we are surrounded by all this digital information, the news, the documents, the web pages, the whole uh, internet is full of information that AI eventually can use. And here, let me take a step back. And you know, we all heard, did you hear about the AI winter in the 70s and all sorts of like, uh, what is it called? Good old fashioned AI, all these types of things. So let me just backtrack here and make us all understand one thing. There is nothing 
winter about that time. I don't think so. Because it's like this. AI wanted to always, from day one, to have a computer that could help, that could uh, simulate intelligence. Think about yourself in the beginning of the 70s, or the 60s, or the uh, 80s, without any internet, anything digital, no GPS, no pictures, no nothing. So the goal was indeed to acquire that information by asking people. How does the doctor make the decision? So they will literally, there was a huge area of like knowledge engineering. You know, there, is, there was no other choice than asking people, making protocol analysis, doing all sorts of acquiring digital knowledge to put on a computer. And then as this knowledge became available in a computer, in some form, incomplete, maybe with uncertainty, incorrect, but that was the way to do it, then it was using expert systems and so forth to show how AI could use such information. So, you know, you have to understand, why did it, why did it became like the winter? It's because the, the process of acquiring the knowledge became like overwhelming. How can you go and talk with like the constructor, the doctor, the, the, the professor? I mean, it just became like a horrible kind of like a burden to have to acquire all these. What is a cat? What is a dog? Do a cat model? I mean, it was overwhelming the lack of input knowledge for these AI algorithms to be able to achieve that. So yeah, people started not doing knowledge engineering as much. Except that in 2007, well, then the internet started, you know, all sorts of like information that happened, and then the iPhone came about. And the iPhone gave us millions of images that people actually put on the internet with captions. And they, they, they look at, look how, if you would plot the amount of information or knowledge available on the internet or available to a computer, it's like a steep. Thing. And now, even steeper, we everything, the credit card, the, 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 the rides on the train, everything is digital. Can you imagine? So now, the thing that's, that's interesting uh, is the fact that you, we, from an engineering point of view, these devices enable the knowledge to be captured digitally. The iPhone, the GPS trackers, everything. So you don't have to ask anything to humans anymore. You just look at the information that is being, how do you say, um, naturally recorded in a digital format. So in some sense, the AI winter was people got tired of asking. And then magically, the information appeared magically available to computers. And now we are in this, in this kind of like world in which why is the AI so, you know, everywhere, it's because, you know, you just have digital data. Do you understand? So that's like, it's nothing wrong, it's just that we were lucky this. And in parallel with the internet and with the digitalization, there is this amazing kind of GPUs, the hardware for computing, that also became much more feasible. So you can do a lot of computation in a much cheaper way than before. So that's when you talk with uh, your students, when you talk with people, there is nothing wrong. This is really a beautiful evolution of the field of AI because of the hardware, because of the knowledge, the internet, because of the digitalization, because of the devices that are able to capture so much more information. Do you understand? So that's like this combination that makes AI be so prominent. So within this, there is a lot of information available online. The only problem with this information available is that it, we have to read it, you know? So it's just too much. So in JP Morgan in particular, people want to know, for example, what is this, the social media saying about a particular kind of like, um, I don't know, a particular kind of like uh, asset, like Apple. Is Apple doing well? Is Netflix doing well? Is, how is this company doing? And Literally, you have to read all these Reddits, Twitters, I mean, opinions, and all the opinions. So what we did was what, with Samina Shah and her team, we came up with this social calculator that basically goes through the, all these social media with a ticker, Apple, or something, Netflix, whatever it is, and literally, from a language point of view, goes through all these data 
and literally computes how many positive things, how many negative and how many neutral things are said about a specific kind of company. And that kind of like counting of how many positive, negative and neutral can be translated in a little indicator from minus one to one on the sentiment analysis of what is the world saying about something. And now I tell you now, does this AI in natural language processing is very accurate? You know, if you say many negatives, I don't think that that company is not doing the right thing when, if you say too many negatives, maybe the AI system counts that as negative, but after all, the double negatives, the triple negatives is positive. Of course, there will be some kind of like error and it doesn't understand everything. But the accuracy uh, 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 is very close to accurate because after all, people don't say these double negations, these, all these confusions. They're very straightforward in their statements. So the beautiful thing is that here is like an AI system, an AI algorithm that is able to convert whatever is there available into something that then the, f the, the industry, the, 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 the operators of the finance world can use. And I, I just want to just use this to say something else that's very important. AI ends up being, one way or another, techniques to change representation, to change from these websites, from the, I'm sorry, from the social media, all in structure, one way or another, it's changed in our case to a number from minus one to one. So it's this, um, it's this transformation of the information from one to the other. And I'll show you several examples of this transformation. And that's somehow how we look at uh, uh, AI. Also, even like a neural net is transforming all these examples into some kind of weights for that architecture that then is used the architecture and not the examples. So we are always in the business of transforming one type of information into another type of information that then it's easier to use in the future. So it's very important for us to understand these AI algorithms as this transformation of information, not Waze. Waze is searching for a path. Playing chess is searching for an action. Optimization is searching. But there is this discovery of information that has to do with this transformation of information. One thing that's very important in this transformation is something that I also want to emphasize that AI uh, basically uh, contributes at in the JP Morgan and in our thinking in terms of research is the standardization of information. So the richness of uh, the, 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 the public information available, digital, is very much. Websites all look differently. Everybody's free to write their website as they want, and that is difficult for a machine learning system or for a, an AI reasoning system to handle so many different places where you write your name, where you write the address, where you write how many publications, everything. Everybody uses that freedom. Humans love to see beautiful formats, but, but for an AI crawler, it's like, oh my gosh, another web page, another format. So it's not uniform the way that things are represented. And so one of the things we've done is that we actually created for companies a standardized representation with all the fields being automatically filled in by going grabbing the information from these websites to this standardized representation. So it's beautiful, the crawling and gathering of the information, all is nice, but then standardizing it and then having the standardized representation being the input for the AI reasoner is really also one of the contributions that we have been doing, okay? So these things, these two th examples, the social calculator and these public information discovery standardized is an example of AI things that we do at, uh, uh, in, within the financial domain. Now, I'm going to jump into another aspect and then uh, two, more, uh, two more things I'll tell you. And, uh, and I will tell you something that's also, uh, I don't have a time now. Anyway, uh, but I'll tell you something that's also very important, which is data. So I want to just uh, highlight to you, and this is something that people always, oh, we, everybody loves data, okay? Real data, real transactions, real images, real text, real everything. But real everything 
is not really very easy. First of all, uh, there, first of all, there could be large amounts, redundant, lots of repetition of the traffic of New York, for example, or other data. It can have difficult access because it might have privacy issues. And also, there is something I want to, to emphasize here. It's actually, how do you say, um, overvalued. The reason why I say this is because real data only captures reality. And so it doesn't help you to go beyond reality. What if there were more chairs in this room? What if there were like less light or more light? So you know, real data only gives you what people decided to do. So because of these problems with real data, we have been at the AI research group creating these synthetic data. And I will illustrate synthetic data with two examples. Uh, so in fact, it's open source, so you can go and use your synthetic data examples. We have done time synthet synthetic time series data, synthetic handwriting, synthetic documents, all sorts of like uh, uh, information calibrated by the real information, but all synthetic information that enables you to explore. So the first example, is the example of markets. So the markets, uh, you know, go as a function of like society, companies, and all of these, and we, and there is a lot of real data on markets. Uh, the markets have also a trace, the historical data, and a lot of the techniques that are used uh, uh, in deployment have to do use using that historical data. Except that the historical data, one more time, doesn't enable you to study what if scenarios, or doesn't enable you to say, uh, what would my policy do if like the interest rates go really high, or the volatility of the, system, of the, signal, of the stocks goes like crazy. So one way or another, it's hard if the historical data doesn't capture that scenario. So we build with Tucker Balch this uh, simulator multi-agent market simulator that we basically have agents, and I will be happy to answer questions about this, but the agents have policies. And the agents have actually parameterized state action pairs. And they have parameters, we can play with the parameters, and within limits of being like, uh, how do you say, uh, within the laws of the game, you can really create tons of synthetic data to study uh, your policies in really different scenarios. So the concept of AI producing simulations that are driven by behaviors, by other parameters, by all sorts of like uh, different aspects of the market, and then you have all these, you know, all these synthetic data of markets. Okay, so this is the first example, is this generation of time series data. And we have this NeuroPS paper, uh, which again, you can check in the publications, that explains how we calibrate this simulation with real data, which means that it's still real, except that it has a margin that enables you to explore a lot of the different signals that can come out of these market uh, data. Another one that's very important for us in the, the, the finance industry is the problem of documents. So you know what these documents, documents are just contracts, annual reports, uh, all sorts of like uh, written materials that people have to read. And they are all in the order of thousands of pages, hundreds of pages, and so AI techniques can do OCR but it, it's important to not just extract the words, but to extract semantics, titles, pictures, equations, graphs. And to do that, we train a neural net to do this. So look at this picture here. There is the, the neural net here that basically is trained on documents. But the problem of these training documents is that if you use real documents, you have to label. Where is the title? Where is the figure? and you have to provide basically manually all these labels that then the machine learns, oh, that this is like a title if it's here or something, these are columns and so forth. Except that instead, if you have your own 
generator of these documents, the generator provides the labels. And somehow with this synthetic data, you are able to get labeling cost zero because you are creating the documents. So I'll give you an example, and I want you to, uh, to understand something. This is a model-driven approach. So we actually have a base net that has, I forget, some number of parameters, 24 or something, in which we basically, uh, you know, have these rules, we have this model that says, what's the probability of the title being the middle? What's the probability of having like three sections with five rows? Whatever, you create all the variables of these documents and you create a gigantic base net that you actually tune these parameters with real data that is able to generate documents that look like real. And I'll give you examples. These are documents generated by the synthetic generator. Nothing of the content here is part of the document. It's all, uh, you know, whatever it's written, it doesn't matter. It's random words, but the layout has a lot of information. And we were only trying to train the machine on extracting information from the layout titles, captions, equations, figures, and all sorts of like uh, uh, lists. And here is an example. Another example completely generated uh, from scratch, uh, completely synthetically generated. This is uh, the work with Natra Natraj Raman. And these things here, tables, and then we can do in any language, oh, these are other, other languages, we can do with noise, we can create kind of appearance that has noise, that is blurred, that is watermarked, and we can create different types of like documents, like, you know, uh, resumes, all synthetically generated, or forms. And interestingly, when we do this with thousands of thousands of thousands of documents, we train these neural nets, and we are able to, very beautiful, detect this type of like uh, landmark information in the document. And the, co the performance is comparable to when we, we actually train with real data and there is labeling cost zero. So look, the first example of synthetic data enabled you to explore the markets because you can generate through these parameter adjustments of the agents all sorts of different techniques to really play on the markets. Here, the synthetic data creates tons of examples that can be used to train a neural net without any labeling cost. Because the generator says title. You put the label title, you feed it into the neural net for this. Is that clear? So this is the value of synthetic data. And if your heart is in real data, I just hope that your, your heart grows from a research point of view all the way to include synthetic data. And then eventually, we, you know, if you want to label the real data, you can. But it's not, uh, it's not really needed. Actually, I was in a talk a year ago, more or less, of someone of a company, I don't know if it's public, if it's not, but someone, a company a training for a, a, a company doing autonomous driving, and they were training on images of cities, so they would like uh, make sure that the autonomous car would learn when to, tr when to brake, when to turn, when to this, when to that. And every single image was simulated. It's very interesting. They had like these amazing SimCity kind of like looks uh, because we have so much good graphics now. They had these, uh, these, these, uh, these images of the car moving in a city that uh, where they could put like the, the kid with the ball coming across with the bikes, with the everything. They would have all these parameters that it's hard to get real data on this. And it was amazing how they train not, I mean, the real data eventually calibrates, makes like what's the, you know, they don't put cars over cars, but uh, it's remarkable how much this concept of synthetic data can empower these uh, AI systems. Okay, the last thing I'm going to tell about uh, is actually uh, about, and I'm going to just, uh, I know I, we are reaching uh, the end, the symbiotic autonomy. And I'm going to tell you something. At CMU, and here comes the robot moving, 
at CMU, we have had these robots moving, these cobot ro robots moving, basically throughout the building, capturing images and making decisions where to go based on maps. The interesting thing about these robots is that they are amazing at navigating, but they don't have arms. And they have a lot of limitations. They cannot, pick up, they cannot press elevator buttons, they cannot pick up objects. And so what we did uh, a few years ago was to introduce the concept of asking for help. And they request help. If you say, where's, go to Manuela's office. Okay, where's Manuela's office? And then they accumulate and learn from that interaction. So the interesting thing is a machine with limitations being able to eventually uh, interact with someone who fills in what they don't know, or they can't. They might intrinsic limitations, which are the arms, and cognitive limitations that they don't know when Manuela's office is. So it's uh, these things. So we did a very similar robot, but it was a document, a document generator. Not, it would not navigate in the rooms of uh, Carnegie Mellon, for sure, but it does generate automatic PowerPoint slides, similar to eventually what uh, our generative AI can do, and this is like several, uh, a few years ago, uh, that basically it can uh, interact with a human, this docubot saying, uh, please uh, do something for me, and uh, execution analysis template, and uh, the, the, the docubot asks, what should I do? It's the same thing, where should I go? and then literally execute that request, executes the request, which is generating all these slides autonomously. From that specific request, we have a, you know, a, 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 several, a whole knowledge base of possible kind of like combinations of slides and is able to do this. And then I'll just show that you also can interact with this DocuBot asking for changes. And here is also where the ask for help comes. If the human kind of says, center the figure, I think it might say, what does it mean center the figure? All the figures in my deck or a particular figure? And then the human says, a particular, all, it doesn't matter. But what matters is that the, the robot, this docubot, is asking what the language does not fill in. So it's uh, uh, requesting more information if it does not match what it needs to know. So this is a very interesting kind of like a parallel between the robot moving down corridors and DocuBot making slides. And so as in, in, a, in, a, in a conclusion, one more thing about humans and robots. So one very important thing was that when I was at Carnegie Mellon and when we see these robots moving, basically you don't know where they have been when they come in front of you by themselves. So we actually had this problem of wanting to know why are you here, why are you late, where do you come from? All these kind of like inquiries about the autonomy of the actual AI system. And so we developed this verbalization with Vittorio Pereira that is able to actually explain. And we have done the same similar thing for explaining uh, outputs of AI systems, again, in the lab, we are doing this, in which when there is a decision, rejection of a credit card or acceptance of a credit card, and you want to justify, if this is a rejection, what we do is that we find an explanation, oops, an explanation based on the closest accepts. And you can generate explanation that says, because, in some sense, these features had these values, you did not cross the boundary for the accept. And so you can see from an explanation point of view, not exactly explaining why, but through these counterfactuals, had you done this, had this comparison with the accept, you can generate explanations that eventually people can act upon. And we call them actionable explanations. So, but anyway, another paper you can look at, but this is like, again, why this is important, the same way that in the robot, is to understand that no matter what, when we'll interact with an AI system, it will still look like a black box, whether it's a neural net, an XGBoost, all sorts of beautiful, whatever technology we use, or ChatGPT, or whatever, it's not clear that we are going to not ask why and all sorts of like uh, explanations on what they're doing. 
So I'm going to skip these, I don't have time. I just want to explain one final thing, which is the actual kind of interaction between humans and machines. Uh, the challenge here is to build something that is sustainable, in which AI and humans interact in a way that over time can become, uh, uh, how do you say, a robust interaction. So here in this architecture, you and you are given a problem, read this document, uh, respond to this email, uh, do the, uh, come up with an explanation for this pricing, whatever it is, we can have a, pro, uh, a test. This is the magic. We have a test that says, oh, this email has more than 10 lines. I think this is too complex. You can make whatever decision you want about the document that enables you to assume that AI can do it or not. And if it can't, then you basically give it to the humans. The humans do it. They have been doing it for eternity, so they can continue doing it. And if you can, you think that AI can do it, you give it to AI. And then AI has a way of knowing whether it has confidence on the outcome. And if it does not have confidence, it gives it back to the human. And everything is saved. So if you think about your AI systems like this, and instead of thinking, oh, this is data that goes in and something comes out, it's something that keeps going, and it's a continuous learning issue. So the AI, over time, will potentially do, do more because we'll develop algorithms that can look at memory. The humans, in principle, will not have to do repetitive tasks over and over, and therefore there is this beautiful kind of like complementarity between AI and humans. So, you know, I always... Uh, People think about AI is going to take jobs, is going to do this. No, no, no. The, the secret here is how do these things will interact? Okay, I know it's 3.49 according to my clock. Uh, uh, I'm just going to spend, if you don't mind, one minute telling you about uh, one example in generative AI. Okay, is that okay? Can I take a little? Or maybe you can ask me a question. Give an example on generative AI and then I can give. <laughs> can give. So let me show you something that's really beautiful. So. This, now this, we have this generative AI thing. This generative AI for, for the financial industry is amazing because imagine how much data, transactions, everything, markets, values, is saved digitally. And now these humans want to know something about all that data and they can use language. They can use language. Usually they use, would have to use some software people to go or some Excel functions, who knows? But they cannot just use language. So I'm going to show you this. This was some work I did with Tucker Botch. So you can say like this. Please write a Python function that reads in a file named ibs.csv with two columns, date and price, and plot the price in blue or whatever. And ChatGPT returns the code to do this thing. And the code produces this. This was literally two minutes. Two minutes. You change the name of the file and you are going to have all the plots you want. When we looked at this, and Tucker looked at this, and he was going to say, well, the dates are hard to read. Look here, we cannot read the dates. And we say, can you print the dates less frequently? So we now are in the chat part of the GPT. We can have context, ChatGPT knows about that graph, knows about that code, and then ChatGPT says, yeah, I, I understand dates less frequently, magic. And it gives you more code, and then magically it comes like this. It slants the dates, does every 20, second, 20 ticks, and just because we said less frequently, the dates are hard to read in English, and it figures this out. And then you can go on and you can say, oh, by the way, why don't you add another plot on the bottom that shows the percentage change in price each day? There you go. And it kept the, days, the dates right. And then you can say more. And you can say like, okay, for the top chart, please add a red line that fits the data using RAMSAC. And on the bottom chart, please add a horizontal line in black at 0, 0. And two dotted red lines uh, at plus and minus one standard deviation. And it does. You know, so this is what AI is about. AI is about understanding that you can talk with a machine through language now. Now, we actually, in this kind of example, sincerely, there was not a lot of experimentation and to say, should we say, the rot, uh, 
two lines, red dotted. No, it kind of was natural the way we were talking, and the thing was naturally creating what we wanted. But other times you have to enter more. But I, just so you know that this is also more than Ramsack, we can also say who are the top five administrators by total access show as a pie chart. And ChatGPT generates this code, which we run on the internal data, and we have the pie chart. So it understands Ramsack, it understands dotted lines, and it understands pie chart. And it also understands sunburst. And you get the sunburst with one word. And literally, and now, just one more example, now we can actually say, so sun, sunburst, pie chart, uh, whatever it's called, uh, um, Ramsack, and all these things, right? dotted lines, uh, rams, they were all known. But the science also of these LLMs is to actually give as APIs the things, the functions that ChatGPT should use for an answer. And here we gave functions that are not Ramsack, that are not pie charts, that are not sunbursts or something. And we say, okay, we wrote the function get agreement. This was Brian, uh, William uh, uh, Bill Watson. Uh, get section, compare test, summarize test. We do this, use this, and then answer this question. You know, retrieve, summarize, and compare differences, determination sections between these agreements. And literally you get this code, you execute it, you have the answer. So now, not only do we assume it knows, but we can give context of what it should know. So that's the end of my talk. It's, uh, I still have seven minutes if you want to ask questions. I apologize, it took me a bit, but, bit longer. But uh, as you see, we touched all these things, and it's important for us to grow these uh, understanding of the large field of AI. Thank you very much. Questions? There we go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the excellent talk. My question is about the predictive Mondrian algorithm that you have. So um, just from looking at the plots, I would say that th the accuracy seems good. Uh, in fact, it's, it's actually pretty amazing that you're able to capture so many of these kind of extreme moves in there. But you're essentially simulating some or predicting a nonlinear system. So if you change the 20% the that's hidden to 30, 40, 50%, at some point, the results are going to look not so good, yes. right? So uh, can you just discuss about the, the limits on the predictability, how far can you predict out with, um, before, yeah, in, in some measurable way that the, the results are not so good. And I'm interested not just in this problem, but, but in some other physical problems like turbulence simulation, yeah. weather prediction, things like that. Exactly, okay. so this is a very good question. Unfortunately, you know, you are going to have to read the paper itself. <laughs> <laughs> You know, this kind of like, uh, you know, this kind of like waving my hands about things or just so to get across, it, it's not going to answer your question. But I tell you one thing, we have done in the paper tons of studies of this, of like less, more uh, sliding windows, because you know what, as the market goes, you are predicting the future, but then you have another new point, and so you adjust the future, and another new point, you are always adjusting. And that's a beautiful thing also of having data that you can use during execution, and we have done that. So you'll see. Of course, if, like the or like 2080, it won't do well. You know, but actually, surprisingly, it's a little bit of a function of how much data you use to train. If you use millions of these kind of like uh, images and stocks, you do quite well. I mean, don't you find that it's awkward that this thing comes up with this kind of like a... But it does. It's it just... It's not... It's, because, it's like when you cover your eye, how come this thing knows that there is an eye behind? It's because it saw so many pictures, so many pictures with two eyes, that it basically learns to complete. It's an in-painting complete mechanism. So it saw probably so many data, so much data, that eventually had that, that it, it learns. Do you understand? And this is actually, here is like all, all the tribute to this technology of neural nets. Because of all these layers, it's able to learn this highly nonlinear kind of thing. Do you understand? But I do believe that, I tell you, I do believe that this technique would be very helpful to predict other things. Earthquake data, climate data, you name it. 
Because one final thought here, I've been in this field for a long time. We, we saw, I saw this going from text to speech to images, but we are still not using images for decision making, for many things. We look at the clouds. We know if it's going to be like sun or not, or we take an umbrella. We use so many th images, and we are not yet in the image decision making business, I'm telling you. So you know, 10 years from now, you'll say, oh, Manuel in 2023 told us that we should, you know, because it's like this. We went from text also to speech. And images are highly underused. Do you know, one final thing. There's a paper by Herb Simon that you might want to like to read. It's called like the usual thing, like a picture is worth a thousand words. You know, for teaching people how to do pulleys, you know, pulleys like, there is no way to teach without images. If you don't draw on your board the thing like this and then the size and another pulley here and another there, how do you explain that the length of this thing is twice the length of that thing? How do you explain? So there are many things we are undervaluing on images. OK? Another question. Hello. Yeah. Is this working? Is it working? Yeah. Yes. A, a lot of your presentation was about different ways of training, how yes. to facilitate the training yes. of a model. But the actual AI, is it always a neural network? Are we converging no. on that? Very good question. Actually, I love this question. So you have to understand something. Um, for example, this type of like, uh, this, uh, this uh, DocuBot is not any neural net. It's basically the mapping between language and parameters of some kind of representation of these templates. So you have, you have a portfolio of millions of things that you can use as slides. But they, are all, they all have variables, like where, which, which, which file should I use? Which, it's all variables, see? And there is nothing there that's about the neural net at all. It's a mapping from language to parameters you need to use. And then when the mapping, and this is such a simple concept, when the mapping does not provide all the parameters, you ask, what do you mean center all the figures? What do you mean this? So the, and I, I, I tell you, I don't see many AI systems asking for anything. Okay, this is my, this is my legacy one day, is like I always thought that these AI systems need to themselves ask, not say, I don't know. It's more, they don't even say I don't know, they send you things with low probability of success. They don't even mention, they don't even have a threshold to say, I don't know, give me more data. They magically classify this cat and say, oh, well, we have 10% probability. Okay, well, then what? See what I'm saying? You have to understand, that nothing of many of these things, these are not neural. Well, the, 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 what is it called? The, the, the large language models are huge transformers. They are huge neural networks. But the thing about the use of the, that neural net for the cognitive aspect, for the analysis, is also different algorithms. See what, but neural nets do have a lot of power to uh, process data into some other type of model. And you have, we all have to check mark and acknowledge the value of that 2017 paper of Google on these uh, transformers, on all these language models. Because what, what happened there was like this. It's the first thing in AI that didn't have a task. We did AI by proving theorems, playing soccer, playing Go, playing chess, uh, translating. Uh, it was all, uh, all about finding shortest routes. It was all about tasks. And these people said, okay, the internet is so much full of knowledge, so much full of language, let's learn a language model. Not for a, uh, nothing. It was like, what do people say? And you have to realize something. We do not say, I ate a chair. We only say, I ate a hamburger. I ate an apple. I ate fruit. So look at how much, no, I ate a chair. I ate an airplane, I ate a building. Nothing of that has no probability of, of coming after I ate something. 
zero probability. So magically, they go through all this language and they learn these probabilities. What's the, the what's the, the how, uh, and we reveal the whole thing. If the internet would have only random sentences, they would have not learned anything. But because it has so much structure, what we say, that's it. What are the things we can eat? Okay, it's a finite set of things, and they are all there on the internet. You understand? And that's like the beautiful thing about this language model is because it's able to just look at the whole thing and just trying to learn a model without even knowing what it's going to be used for. One final question. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for the informative session. So uh, my question is regarding the Mondrian uh, AI. Yes. So Everybody asks about <laughs> Mondrian. I talk about so many things. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's the mystery of these images. Go ahead, yes. Yeah, so like uh, you, we basically have the data. So yes. why are we treating it as an image classification? That's like, uh, very why good are we question, very the, good question. Yeah. I always get this question. What if you train just with the numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Or what yes. if, okay. For the classification, it doesn't do that much better than the numbers. It's the same thing, okay? With some normalization, whatever. For the prediction, it does much better. Much better. And you'll see on the paper. Magically, the prediction, the image, does better than any function. And this is why, in fact, the function is so nonlinear that we don't have math. We don't have math that is able to learn that well, the numbers coming up and down, up and down for the future. But an in-painting technique, after having seen that the images are always completely like this, it's able to capture. But again, here my point is like this. You may want to process this signal with whatever signal processing techniques you have, everything. However, there are many things that are images that we use for decision making. And this is just one example, but there are other things. Like I tell you, when we go to, an EE, uh, to a doctor that does like an EEG to you, they, they, it comes this little piece of paper, ta -ta 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 -ta, right, that, right? What does the doctor do? Come to the office, looks at the piece of paper and says, everything is normal. How is that possible? They did not look at anything else except the plot. Ta -ta 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 -ta. And there may so many things like this. So what I'm saying is that I, we need to open our hearts for images as a source for decision making. That's my only point here. Maybe there are other techniques. And in fact, this is not being used by the traders. They believe that they have other methods. Whatever they have, that's fine. You understand? Very good. Thank you very much. Okay. Ah, it's a, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and talk. Uh, to show our appreciation, I'd like to give you a, a token of gift, although it looks very bulky. But thank you very much. And, and I know I know the teacher. So uh, let's go to the reception now. Thank you for coming.